Okay, we, um, hmm, I have a little internal bet placed of whether we can f- actually finish numbers this morning. Do you think? It's possible. We'll at least get to this second to last chapter, uh, and, and we'll just see what happens, but I'll stop talking and let's just start going for it. So, <clears throat> okay, here's, uh, here's the picture here. Remember, this is numbers in the wilderness which uh, is easy to break into parts based off of the three regions where they're, where they're at in the book. So they start at Sinai, they get all organized and together, they get to Kadesh, and then it all just falls apart. And so they end up wandering for uh, a cycle of 40 years uh, as the Exodus generation dies off because of their selfishness and their sin and their rebellion. And then after months, I think it was, of sad face stories, we got these bizarre, strange, uh, bright spot stories with the story of uh, Balaam or Balaam, however you want to say his name. And uh, he's a good guy or bad guy? Yeah. Yeah, you know, he's kind of like the rest of us, you know? So he's both or neither, I don't know. Uh, So he ends up becoming a conduit for God's blessing, uh, even though the king of Moab is intent on on cursing. But then all of a sudden, as soon as that's over, he's involved in this plot or conspiracy to get Israel to assimilate and intermarry with the Midianites and the Canaanites and adopt their gods and all that kind of thing, and that ended poorly. So the Exodus generation uh, died off right after this, and so kind of what unifies all of these stories from last week, but certainly from the the last chapters of the book, is they are all forward pointing. Uh, They're all, every every single one is connected to their future in in the promised land. And so you remember um, Moab, where they're placed is, just on this handy map that I've got up here, where they're placed, remember, um, they came up from the south here from Egypt, and then um, they came up and they're in the plains of Moab right above the Dead Sea. And so this is, it's in modern day Jordan in this area. It's corresponding to Jerusalem, which is over here. And so they're just in these hills uh, of Moab up here. And so uh, everything, they can literally, you know, they can see across and see the land and they, every story is oriented towards the land. Um, so this is the theme. We haven't talked about it too much. We might as we, well, no, we'll talk about it more when we get into the beginning of Deuteronomy. But just this, um, this scene of being in the wilderness. We've been in the wilderness for a long time now, right? <laughs> Within the book of Numbers. And there's something really significant about these stories just in the shape of the whole story of the Bible, Um, because they're looked back upon. The prophets look back upon the wilderness period. The poets in in the Psalms do. And also a number, many of the New Testament authors look back uh, to this period in the wilderness as being this this image of the in-between space that God's people are in, where the act of salvation has occurred back here in the Exodus, and the promised land is still ahead, uh, in the land of Canaan, and here are God's people now in the middle in the wilderness, and it's a time of journey, it's a time of testing, it's a time of hardship, and a time of transformation for, for a lot of these people. And so uh, it's just a very powerful symbol and an image, and it'll kind of carry through in what we're, what we're doing today and then as we get into the early chapters of Deuteronomy, that being in the wilderness is a strange gift for God's people, <laughs> because none of us wish to be in the wilderness. In fact, most of the time it's pretty miserable, but there's something very important happening in, uh, in shaping the hearts of God's people, teaching them about themselves and about God's justice, but also about his grace. And so some of these stories kind of get us into the, the window of that theme. So chapter 32 is where, uh, where we're at. so let's um they're literally at this little place i had my cursor right here and they're getting ready making preps preparations to go go across and then something happens something quite surprising so the reubenites 
the Gadites, who had very large herds and flocks. They saw that the lands of Yazer and Gilead were very suitable for their livestock. So they came to Moses and Eleazar the priest and also to the leaders of the community and they said, all these towns, Ataroth and Dibon and Yazer, Nimra, Heshban, Eliale, 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 God goes up? I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, might be the meaning, but I'm without looking at it, I'm not sure. Uh, Sebam, Nevo, and Beon, all these towns. The land that the Lord subdued before the people of Israel, these are very suitable for livestock, and uh, your servants have a whole bunch of livestock, so if we found favor in your eyes, mm, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Don't make us go across the Jordan. Now, so just pause real quick here. So the regions that they're talking about <clears throat> are, they're kind of in the south region here, but the, it's all this gray area right here. In fact, this map is corresponding from the ESV, ESV study Bible that corresponds to this story right here. <clears throat> and so there, the towns that they just described are in all these, all this gray area right here. And essentially, there's saying this was not land promised to Abraham or anything like that, but they're over there and they're like, man, it's really great pasture land over here. Our cows like it, you know, our sheep like it. So let's, they make this request. Uh, don't make us cross the Jordan and uh, we'll just take this as our, as our possession. Now, don't read on. What do you think of this request? <laughs> so I'm, get, Tom, I'm getting a head shake now. Others of you are like, uh, you're not sure. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, I mean, is it a reasonable request? Yeah. It's great pasture land over here. Our cows like it. Why, I mean, why make us go all the way over there? We're already here. So that seems like it's reasonable. But um, what, what stories are ringing in our ears that would make us think, oh, no. No, let's not, let's not do this again, right? So this is not land promised to Abraham. The, the green region, the land of Canaan, is the land that, uh, you know, that they've had their sights on and so on. Um, what's, uh, what story is ringing in our ears? Well, there's that story about the spies that went in and came back and was like, yeah, we can't take that land. And so is this going to be another uprising? Is this a, a division of God's people? I mean, this is a river valley that splits these two areas in half right here. And so is that going to introduce other divisions where the whole point is that they are all compacted in this other region? So look at what Moses thinks about this. <clears throat> Verse 6. So Moses uh, said to the Gadites and to the Reubenites, Shall your countrymen go to war while you just sit here? Why do you discourage the Israelites from going over to the land the Lord has given them? This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to look over the land. After they went up to the valley of Eshkol and they viewed the land, they discouraged the Israelites from entering the land the Lord had given them. And so the Lord's anger, you'll remember, was aroused from that day and he swore an oath because they have not followed me wholeheartedly. Not one of the men 20 years old or more who came up from Egypt will see the land I promised to oath to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. No one except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. And so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. He made them wander in this desert 40 years until the whole generation of those who had done evil in his sight was gone. So he recounts the history. Remember last time uh, there were people who, who didn't want to go into the, into the land. So verse 14, and so here you are, a brood of sinners. <laughs> this is just a great line. So a brood of sinners standing in the place of your fathers. Remember, so this is the, new, this is the second generation here. And Moses Moses is just interpreting this. This is not going to go well right here. 
you're standing in the place of your fathers, you're going to make the Lord even more angry with Israel. If you turn away from following him, he will again leave all this people in the desert and you are going to be the cause of their destruction. So they came up to him. And that, so that's a rather severe response. Uh, is it a justified response? Yes. Yeah, I think for the most, for the most part. Um, he could be overreacting a little bit. Does he know their motives fully at this point? No, he doesn't, but it's just fascinating. There's, there's all this, there are all these actually gaps in the story and questions about, so let's keep on reading. Verse 16. So then they came up to him and they said, well, we would like to build pens here for our livestock and, and cities for the women and children, but we are ready to arm ourselves and we'll go ahead of the Israelites until we've brought them into their place. But meanwhile, our women and children can live here in, in fortified cities, that means with big uh, walls, for protection from the inhabitants of the land. And we will not return to our homes until every Israelite has received his inheritance. We will not receive any inheritance with them on the other side of the Jordan because our inheritance has come to us on, on the east side. So they're modifying their proposal, basically. <laughs> So instead of saying, don't make us go over at all, they're saying, okay, well, Moses, this, this has struck a chord with you, right? Struck a nerve. And so how about we actually lead the charge, we'll send our soldiers over, and none of them will come back until all the other tribes are, get, get their uh, inheritance in the land and so on. Verse 20. So Moses said to them, if you're going to do this, if you'll arm yourselves before the Lord for battle, and if you will go over, armed uh, over the Jordan before the Lord until he's driven his enemies out before him, then when the land is subdued before the Lord, you may return and be free from your obligation to the Lord and to Israel. And this land will be your possession before the Lord. But if you fail to do this, you'll be sinning against the Lord. And be sure that your sin will find you out. Um, this, there's only like two or three times this metaphor of your sin finding you uh, occurs. And this is the first one in the whole Bible. You guys heard this line before? Your sins will find you out or something. This is, this is the first time that it occurs in this story. Um, so there it is. I, the metaphor speaks for itself. Be sure that your sin will find you out. Build cities. For your women and children, pens for your flocks, but do what you've promised. The Gadites, the Reubenites said to Moses, We, your servants, we will do all that our Lord commands. Our children, our wives, our flocks, our herds will remain right here in the cities of, of Gilead. That's this, that region right there. But your servants, every man armed for battle, will cross over to fight before the Lord, just as our Lord says. And so Moses gave orders about them to Eleazar the priest, and Joshua the son of Nun to the family heads of the Israelite tribes. And he said, If the Gadites and the Rumanites, every armed man for battle, cross over the Jordan with you before the Lord, when the land is subdued before them, give them the land of Gilead as their possession. If they don't cross over with you armed, they must accept their possession in the land of Canaan. And so the Gadites and Rumanites answered, Your servants will do what the Lord has said. We will cross over the Lord into Canaan armed, but the property we inherit will be on this side of the Jordan. Summary. Then Moses gave to the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, the whole land with its territories around them. And then what follows is uh, a couple summary paragraphs of how they went into different cities and built them up just like they said they were going to do, gave them some new names, and then they settled there, and then they're going to, going to move on uh, to cross the Jordan to help the other tribes get into the land. And that's the story. <laughs> so this is, this, is an odd, this is an odd story for a lot of different reasons. There's kind of like, why, why do I need to know this? Um, so there's a purely historical reason that... that is, it's underneath the story, um, namely that this green region are the kind of classical boundaries of what's called the land of Canaan. 
And why is it that two and a half tribes of Israel ended up not uh, settling in this land, but ended up settling all, all over in this area over here? And so this story is giving you kind of some historical background as to why, why that's the case. Because as you read on, it's just all of a sudden there's all these Israelite tribes over here in land that was never part of the promise. So there's a historical thing going on here, but I, I do think there is something more, um, more significant. Can you think of another, this is really reaching back, can you think of another story in the Torah where you had, um, you had uh, some people, there was too much livestock, and so they parted ways, and one of them went to a region that was not really part of the land promised to Abraham. Can you think of such a story? Do you remember? Lot. Yeah, Lot. Lot. Now, so this is in Genesis chapter 13. <clears throat> so it's the story of Abraham and Lot separating. Um, Abram went up from Egypt. This was after the first time he tried to give away his wife. And uh, he and his wife and all they had with him. And Lot was with him. And who, who did God tell Abram uh, to leave behind when he came to Canaan? His whole family. Um, and who did he bring with him? Some of his family. Right? And who causes him immense trouble for a long, long, long time in all kinds of complicated ways? Lot, lot. And specifically this story here is interesting. Abram was really rich in livestock. And uh, go down, verse 5, Lot, who went with Abram, he also had flocks and herds and tents, and so the land couldn't support both of them. Their possessions were so great, and there ended up being strife and so on between, you know, Abram's shepherds and, and Lot's shepherds. And so uh, they end up parting ways, and Lot uh, chooses what at that time seemed to be the most choice regions of the land, which are these, uh, these regions down here south of the Dead Sea. Uh, the, the lands connected to the, the cities then of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that all just goes badly. Lot gets kidnapped and Abraham has to go rescue him and that creates a whole thing. And then there's the whole Sodom and Gomorrah episode. And so, and then, uh, you know, oh, we talked about that a couple weeks ago and then Lot ends up sleeping with his two daughters and then those two, um, the children of those become two tribes, one of whom is Moab <laughs> over here, and the other is the people of the Ammonites who were really difficult thorns in the side of Israel for a long time. So in other words, it's, it seems this very slight, random little act of I don't, negligence or disobedience, call it what you want. It was a little thing that wasn't exactly what Yahweh wanted, but it didn't seem like a big deal at the time, and then it cascades and snowballs into bigger and bigger problems for Abraham and Abraham's family. And there's something really similar going on in, in this story right here in Numbers 32. Is there anything wrong with having great pasture land for your fox? Not particularly, you know. Um, but is this the land that was promised to Abram? Abraham? N no, no. And so they, even they've, they modify their proposal. They're like, oh yeah, we don't want to cause problems here, so we want to obey, so how about we'll stay here because that's the big deal for us, but we'll at least go over. And they're going to go over. They do it, they keep their word, and then they come back to these lands. And you don't hear about it for a long time. You're just like, okay, that was an interesting, interesting little episode. But um, put your thumb right here and go forward with me to the book of Second Kings chapter 10. <clears throat> so in Second Kings, this is way down the line here. This is like 20, 2017 or something like that by the time we get there. So um, this is right after the reign of um, one of the kings of Israel, Ahab. You guys know about Ahab? Good guy, bad guy? Not a, yeah, bad guy. Um, for lots of different reasons. And so uh, the, the guy who was responsible for the downfall of Ahab's family and of his house is a guy named Jehu. 
who drives chariots like nobody else. He drives like Jehu. Anyway, wasn't there a band? There was a band. Yes, yeah. It's such a great story, though. Because there's like a watchman who sees him coming from far away, and he's coming to bring doom on the house of Ahab and so on. And then the watchman's like, he, it's, he drives like the driving of Jehu. <laughs> it's like, what, do, what does that even mean? Like he swerves his chariot really good or something? Like what does that mean? Anyway, so Jehu, so Jehu um, ends up wiping out the whole house of Ahab, and he's a, he's a tool, a very imperfect tool that Yahweh uses to bring uh, his justice on Ahab's house. But then... Uh, go down to verse 30, <clears throat> Second Kings, Second Kings chapter 10, verse 30. The, uh, the Lord said to Jehu, because you've done well in accomplishing what's right in my eyes, you've done to the house of Ahab all I handed mind, your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. However, the narrator goes on, Jehu was not careful to keep the Torah of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart, he didn't turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, which he caused Israel to commit. And so you're like, oh, oh, bummer. You know, oh, Jehu, he does the right thing, but then, oh, he does bad. And then right here, a little notice. In those days, <clears throat> the Lord began to reduce the size of Israel. And this is, Second Kings is, is part of the slow deterioration. They get into the land and uh, after David, it all just goes downhill, and areas of Israel, due to all kinds of reasons, <clears throat> mostly due to their, uh, their idolatry and uh, not trusting Yahweh and continuing to make political alliances with other nations instead of relying on Yahweh, they just, they can, the, whole, the whole thing is about the land getting reduced, 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 as they uh, become more... Uh, and, and more kind of all skimmed off, as it were, through Yahweh bringing justice on them. And so, he began to reduce the size of Israel. And Hazael, who's the king of uh, the region of Syria up here, the capital was uh, Damascus, Hazael overpowered the Israelites throughout their territory, east of the Jordan, in all the land of Gilead, now, these are the regions of which tribes? Gad, Reuben, Manasseh. From Aroer by the Arnon, Gorge through Gilead, and Bashan. <clears throat> so there's this little reference here, lay, way later on in history. How did settling outside of the land promised to Abraham, how did this go for these tribes in the long run? Yeah, it's this little note here, <clears throat> hundreds of years down the line, where uh, as part of the bigger story of Israel's sin and uh, the nation failing as the covenant people of God, they're the first group of tribes to get wiped off the map. Now it doesn't say right here, because of their sin and choosing this land or something, it doesn't say that, but there is this clear reference. Here, remember, this is the region of Gad, Reuben, Benes. It's referring right back to Numbers 32, the story that you and I just read. And it doesn't moralize, you know. It doesn't do a little sermon, but it just reminds you um, that this is the region that these tribes chose. And that's, that's all you get about this story right here. And so I think you're just left to think about it. This is one of those stories, I think a lot like Lot and Abraham, which is why I brought it up, where it's a story... It's not like their first proposal was obviously it made Moses really, really concerned about the negative effects of their decision. Um, is their decision fully in line with God's promises as God stated them? No. Is it a horrible, sinful, bad decision? Well, no. But is it fully obedience and faith to God's promises? No. And it, in my mind, a story like this exists in that space. It's precisely that space of what goes on in your head where you're like, is it wrong? Well, it's not really wrong, but is it right? Is, it, is this really faithful to following Jesus? Well, okay, I, no, no, it's not. But is it really bad? No, it's not really bad. <laughs> but is it actually faithful? You know what I'm saying? Have you been there before? You guys know what I'm talking about. 
Yeah, uh, so I think the story with Lot and this story, two stories in the Old Testament that address this limbo space where it doesn't seem, it's not horrible, bad compromise. It doesn't seem like the consequences are that significant or whatever, but it's not full faithful obedience to what God has called his people to do. And then in both of those stories, Lot and these tribes, what you get is these later working out of that decision that actually had really tragic or negative consequences. And I'm, I don't know. I'm not going to sermonize any more on that other than just think about that. These are two, this is a, a realm of the area of obedience um, that we tend to minimize or not think about very much. But you know when you're in the space <laughs> of a decision and uh, I think these stories just stand there as, as these warnings to, to make us think twice about these types of decisions. Because in the moment, it seems fine. It seems totally fine. Um, and we're never even told explicitly, like Yahweh judged them for their sin, but the consequences of their decision had big ramifications as, uh, as the decades went by. Isn't that an interesting story? Mm-hmm. Numbers 33, mm -hmm. chapter 33. <clears throat> Here are the stages in the journey of the Israelites when they came out of Egypt by divisions under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. At the Lord's command, Moses recorded the stages in their journey. This is their journey by stages. The Israelites, they set out from Ramses on the 15th day of the first month, the day after Passover. They marched out boldly in full view of all of the Egyptians who were burying their firstborn, whom uh, the Lord had struck down among them, for the Lord had brought judgment on whom? What does it say? Their gods. Now that's interesting. Um, so a couple things here. What, what is, and then look at the rest of Numbers 33. What is Numbers 33? <laughs> it's the only chapter like it in the whole Bible. It's the road trip itinerary. <laughs> look at it. Look at it. It's exactly, it's, it's the itinerary of a 40-year road trip. <laughs> and uh, actually what's interesting is you go down from verse 3. They leave Ramses and then they start going. Duh, 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 duh. And you can read them all. Um, go down to verse uh, 47 where it finishes. <clears throat> they left Almon, Diblataim. They camped in the regions of Avarim near Navo. They left the mountains of Avarim. They camped uh, on the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. These are the plains of Moab. They camped along the Jordan from Beth Yeshemoth to Abel Shittim. And so that's where they stay until they, they cross over into the land. So you have from the Exodus, from Egypt, all the way down to where they are right here in this, in this region, waiting to go over as they get prepared. And in between, if you count up all the places that they camp, can, guess how many are there? Come on, the number's too easy. Can you guess? How, how many years were they wandering? And how many place names are right here? Forty. Come on, let's do good. So, did he leave out some places to make the numbering fit? You know, we don't know. Um, but it's, it's part of the, the artistry of the chapter. And the other thing that's interesting is there are 40 places named here. Um, there's, hmm, I forget, it's 20, 17, 17, it's 17 or 18, something like that, of these places aren't mentioned anywhere else in the actual story. Um, so uh, almost half of these places you've never heard about before, which means this. Actually, it, it means a lot of things. But what it means is even the Torah is not giving us a complete historical account of the events that have taken place. Um, and Moses and uh, the editors and authors uh, who came after him to shape the story, they selectively chose these specific stories to get the theological message across that they wanted to do. Does that make sense? 
So uh, to me, that's just always interesting. It's kind of, this is similar to at the end of the Gospel of John, where he uh, says, listen, you know, there's so many other stories about Jesus that I could tell, but I have specifically chosen these ones to compel you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And I think this is somewhat similar. It's almost as if Moses is saying, you know, there's so many other stories about the wilderness I could tell you, but I've chosen these ones to get the message across that I've been trying to get across. Um, so let's see. So that's a cool thing that's interesting about the chapter. Um, go back to chapter 33, verse 4. Oh, you're in chapter 33, but verse 4. <clears throat> Uh, it's this interesting little comment and reflection back on the Exodus. And who, who received Yahweh's justice uh, in, the, in the plagues and so on of Egypt? What is it, who does it say right here? The gods of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? So if you actually read the stories of the ten plagues, it doesn't say that explicitly anywhere. Um, but right when they come out, of Egypt in the Passover instructions, there's a similar comment just like this one where Yahweh reflects back and he says, that was me bringing my judgment on the gods, on the gods of Egypt. This is what uh, has what led um, people to kind of look for significance in each of the 10 plagues um, because there were certain of the plagues that seem aimed at different Egyptian deities, you know, like the Nile and and the sun and so on. but anyway, that's just an interesting little, little comment there in chapter 33. So, uh, so there you go. That's chapter 33. I don't have much more to say about that, except that uh, it contributes to this overall portrait here that the, the Pentateuch, the Torah, um, it's going to end here at the end of Deuteronomy. The people have still not gone into the land. And it's this theme of the journey, of God's people on this journey, that the Torah ends... And there's still no resolution to that journey. The promised land is still, is still far off. And so God's people are in this time of testing. And sometimes it's issues of clear, deliberate rebellion and disobedience. But other times, like chapter 32, it's these little, it's these little things, right? These little issues, and, uh, which also end up being a test of their obedience. And in this case, these tribes failed. And... Uh, Yahweh didn't bring the hammer or something, but he let the consequences of their decisions work out. And this is all part of the strange time of being in the wilderness when God's people are tested. Let's keep going. Verse 50. On the plains of Moab, by the Jordan, across from Jericho, Yahweh said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you cross the Jordan and when you go into Canaan, notice everything's oriented forward here towards going to the land, drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. Destroy their carved images and their cast idols and demolish their high places. Have we talked about high places yet? They haven't really occurred very much. This is really a big Big deal as you get on in the story. So um, high places were, um, let me think. Do we have pictures? Um, Well, yes, I can show you one picture. Um, So high places were uh, very similar to the concept of like mountains having at their top sacred places. There's no huge, huge mountains in the land of Canaan and so on. But hilltops were very common locations for like shrines to different deities. And so there's a, a couple deities in particular, but one, um, let's see. Mm. Yeah, here they are. Um, so this is, a, <laughs> this is so cool. Let me see if other pictures here. The, the, Tell Dan, yeah. So um, this is a city. Oh, it's not a very good picture. Oh, you can get the idea. Okay, this is uh, the city of Dan, which is one of the most well-preserved right now. Um, ruins, one of the most significantly well, best-preserved ruins of an ancient Israelite city anywhere uh, in Israel. And it's way up in the north. Kind of, It's even north of, of Galilee where Jesus grew up, the city of Dan. 
And uh, this is the, en the, ga the city gate entrance area. These walls used to be much higher. And then there was a big gate right here. And then a big paved courtyard out here. And it's cool because you can go in through the gate and then, then there's an inner courtyard and then there's these benches and so on. And you can still see um, like the, the carved out uh, pivots for the door hinges that they would swing on. It's so awesome, you know, and it's like Ahab, Ahab cruised in the city. Anyway, so, um, but right outside in the outer courtyard, there's this little s stone, um, I don't know what you call it, a little, what we might call like a little wall of what would look like a flower bed. But what is in there is not flowers. <laughs> what was in there is all of these um, stones that uh, were upright and that seemed to have some sort of carving on them that, that can't be deciphered anymore. Um, and f fitting the description and from what they found at other places, there's lots of other Israelite towns and there were also little hilltop shrines or temples that had a similar looking little installation just like this one. And so um, what the archaeologists think what we're looking at here uh, is little remnants of what one of these high places was like. And so perhaps there were probably some kind of wooden poles of which there would have been attached little shrine idols sitting here and you would offer incense or sacrifices, or as you're going into the city, you would put gifts here to the gods, and they're like the protective gods of the city, that kind of thing, or they're idols. And so these, uh, these were really common and really widespread, uh, in, and in, even in Israel, in the cities of Israel, they were just everywhere, and they're going to get talked about over and over and over again. And so... Um, that's what's being spoken of here. It's sort of like, it's like the, do we have anything like this where before you go into someone's house or a town, you stop by somewhere and you do something and it's, may the gods look favorably upon me or something like that. I don't know. Do we have a version of that? I'm not sure. I need to think about that. Anyway, we'll be talking about the high places a lot more. So, but that's the idea here. And the idea is that this is deeply offensive to Yahweh because who brought them out of Egypt? Yahweh did. Who gave them the gift of this land? Yahweh did. Who provides rain and, and crops and so on? Who's their real, who is their God? It's Yahweh. And so these, uh, these uh, practices are, are deeply dishonoring to who Yahweh is as their God. And so he's telling them, like, when you move, when you come into cities and so on, just get rid of all of this stuff. Verse 53. Take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given you the land to possess. Distribute the land by lot according to your clans. To the larger group, give a bigger inheritance. To a smaller tribe, give a smaller one. Whatever falls to them by lot will be theirs. Distribute it according to your ancestral tribes. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land. Those you allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will give you trouble in the land where you live and then I will do to you what I planned to do to them. That's, that's a stiff word right there, isn't it? That's kind of intense. Um, so again, you have this, this challenge to not adopt um, the gods and the, and the religious practices of the Canaanites. But this is interesting too. So if you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land, what is, what is the form of Yahweh's judgment on their disobedience? Does he, bring, does he rain down the ten plagues like he did with Egypt? No. What, what is the form of Yahweh's justice on their disobedience? At least first. So wh what it's going to be is the, the Canaanites, who you choose to dwell and intermarry with and intermingle with, that, that's your judgment, is to get what you wanted. <laughs> do you see that right here? So if you don't drive them out and you choose not to do that, What's at least phase one of Yahweh's judgment? Well, 
you're gonna you gonna lay in the bed that you've made. You know, that's kind of, kind of you made the bed, so lay in it now. And it's going to they're going to become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your side. And they will give you they Yahweh doesn't need to give them trouble. They're going to create enough trouble and negative consequences for themselves. In the land, in the land where you live, this is one of the first places where this is another little sub theme that's going to get brought up a whole bunch. So yes, exile is going to be the end of the game. I'll do to you what I plan to do to them. That is, give them the boot from the land. But leading up to that is going to be this long, sordid, tragic story of Israel just making stupid decisions, being influenced by the religion and and ethics of the Canaanites. And it's all just going to go horribly, horribly wrong. And Yahweh doesn't have to do anything. He just has to give them over to their decisions. And that is, no, there's no better summary of Judges, Samuel, and Kings uh, than this little description right here. Yahweh doesn't actually have to do very much. Their own negative consequences be become the form of Yahweh's justice on their actions. Um, does that make sense? What's, hap what's happening here? And then exile stands at the end of that. So um, both 32, chapters 32, we're reflecting on the same thing about obedience and the strange realm of it's not quite disobedience, but it's not full obedience. Whereas here, this is really an act of, of disobedience to Yahweh. But even in this case, he's just letting the negative consequences play, play themselves out. Chapter 34. Yahweh said to Moses, Command the Israelites and say to them, When you enter into Canaan, the land that will be allotted to you as an inheritance will have these boundaries. And then what is chapter 34? <laughs> so you could say, these are such boring chapters, Tim. But no, they're not boring at all. So this is uh, essentially a verbal map. You're looking at a verbal map. You could have drawn a map. Um, and in fact, uh, the editors of the ESV Study Bible have drawn the, the map uh, for you here. But uh, it's a verbal, a verbal map. So look at verse 3. What border, what side uh, is it describing right here? Right, the southern, the south border down here. And here's all the places. It's describing a little line going, going through towns. Uh, verse 6. <laughs> what's the western boundary? The Mediterranean, <laughs> so that's a pretty easy one, right? The Mediterranean Sea. The coast, that's your boundary to the west. Verse 7, it's your northern boundary. So run a line from the Mediterranean all the way over here. And then verse 10, your eastern boundary, run a line here. The end of verse 12, this is your land with its boundaries on every side. So Moses commanded... Uh, verse 13, commanded the Israelites, assign this land by lot as an inheritance. The Lord ordered that it be given to the nine and a half tribes because, well, remember, the families of the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of the Manasseh, they got the, that, uh, uh, the inheritance on the east side. And then you get a list of the tribal leaders who are going to do all of this. Last verse of the chapter, these are the men uh, the Lord commanded to assign the inheritance to the Israelites in the land, in the land of Canaan. So again, this is a preparatory <coughs> chapter um, describing uh, the, the borders of the land that the people are going to come into. Um, this is the first time the boundaries of the land are clarified. So there's been a land promised to Abraham. Uh, there's been general descriptions of it so far. And here's what's interesting, though, is this is the land described. You see it up here on the green on the map. Even this land was never fully occupied in the green here by Israel historically. Um, so this kind of this line up here, this is the Sea of Galilee. Jesus grew up right here in these hills right here. So um, the river keeps going uh, up here. And pretty much right here at this line... The cursor is, is the furthest north that Israel ever went. And this was all became the region of uh, the people of Tyre and Sidon and another city up here called Ugarit and so on. And so even the boundaries described here in chapter 34 were never fully historically realized by the people 
of Israel. And, you know, th there's not a lot of comment on that. I th it's one of these other things where the facts just kind of speak for themselves. That uh, things, Israel n never had a season where it was fully trusting and obeying. And what Israel became in the land um, was always kind of a, a dim half realization of, of what the ideal was. And it's both because of real flagrant, disobedient rebellion, but also this kind of limbo land of half obedience like you get in Numbers chapter, chapter 32. So these are such interesting stories. We're not going to make it to the end of the book of Numbers. I have such great hopes at 5 a.m. on Wednesdays. I'm like, yes, we're going to go for it. So it's okay. We'll finish it next week. Um, so let's just, let's just leave and, and or kind of close and just pause on these couple stories right here because it's so interesting. I think these are very clear, they, of these stories of rebellion with negative consequences. But then you have these other stories where you have real rebellion, but Yahweh just allows you to sit in the mess that you've made. And that's the form of his justice working itself out. And then there's this other story of this kind of half obedience. It seems reasonable, but it's not what I know I should probably do. And that itself has negative consequences, but over such a long period of time, you would never even know or predict where that decision is going to go. And this is a part of living in the wilderness uh, where our salvation is already secured, the promised land is still yet future, and it's the day-to-day -day testing of the obedience of God's, of God's people. So that, just in and of itself, is a powerful message. I don't know what you need to hear from that today. Um, but that's, uh, that's the book of Numbers. It's exploring uh, life in the wilderness for us.